that you're probably probably noticing is that it's um uh diana did you have a you wrote, rose your hands did you have a question or were you just playing you might have been turned in on time though hold on. it's not donna yeah. donna okay. hold on mute. it's okay yeah, <laughs> i'm here can, yeah can you mute because we can hear oh i'm sorry i'm sorry yes She's gone. <laughs> oh, okay, good. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's um, one of the things to remember. I'm just in two meetings today where one went horribly wrong because the people that had called in, um, there was three that weren't me mu muted and nobody could hear Dr. Buckley. So, so that's one thing to remember when you host it is that to start out either default where everybody has to come in muted or that you talk through um, what muting is and the importance of it. Um, even though it's quiet now for, for me, whenever I choose not to mute, inevitably, if I'm at home, my husband, kids, somebody's going to walk in and create noise. So it's always good if you're not talking just to keep it on mute because things always come up. All right, so I'm going to go back to the sign in screen. Oh, and see, I'm not in the right. Okay. So sign in. Mm, why is it taking me? Oh, I'm sorry, not sign in. Sign up, lied. Sign up is what you want. Um, all of these fields have to be filled in. So you're just going to go through and fill each of them in. A couple things to remember is that you want to use the same email address that you have in Canvas. So it has to be that .edu. Um, if you're looking to link this up with Canvas for any reason, um, you just want to make sure you have that same email address in there. The other thing is anecdotally what we're hearing is that if you put in SCCCCD, it seems like it's auto approving much quicker. Um, that was just what I got feedback from a couple of faculty today. So before I would have said Reedley College as your organization, but it sounds like if you put um, State Center Community College District, um, they might be getting through those processing quicker. So that's my that's my recommendation. Even though uh, we don't have access to the sccc.edu email? Uh, that part doesn't matter. To us. Yeah, it's just an organization. Okay, so just SCC. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's that's not an official word um, from Confer Zoom. It's just what a couple of faculty have told me today that if they when they used SCCCD, it was approved um, within a day, if not quicker. So that's I'm giving that information so that we can hopefully expedite it. So they might have just put the district on a um, quick approval or something like that to okay. make it easier. Okay. okay, thank you. Give it a try. Um, okay, Shauna, you have your hand raised. I don't know if you're just playing around or you wanted me to call on you, some of the features in Zoom. And you are muted if you're talking. Okay, I was just writing stuff down, so. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry, <laughs> yeah. So Confer Zoom has some options to raise, their, raise your hand. And so if you have a session where you are the host and you've made it so you have to manually unmute somebody, then that's one of the features that you can have is, is that people have to raise their hand. Or if you've got 50 people and you don't want everybody talking at once and you can ask people to raise their hands. So after you go through this process, you hit sign up, you're just going to get a standard boilerplate response that says within 72 hours, you're going to get an email to activate your account. Um, so and it'll come from CCCC Confer. Um, check your spam if you haven't received it within 72 hours. Um, most of the time, it seems like they're coming through our spam filter, but if you haven't received it, you'll need to get that email to activate your account. Unfortunately, since I have an activated account, that's not an email I can show you, but it's pretty self-explanatory. It's the same as, as most of those emails we get that says activate your account, click the link, ta-da, you're activated. Okay. All right. Um, any questions about this? So I would, as we're on the call, do this right now and then it's done and taken care of. Go to Confer Zoom um, because it is going to take up to 72 hours, they're telling us, to get that process. And you want to make sure and get it started as soon as possible. So I would recommend um, doing it right now. I can pause for a couple of seconds while you guys get there and log in. But I do highly recommend um, taking the time to do that right now. How many have already have confer Zoom accounts? Nope, okay, perfect. And you can do it right now. Amanda, I think I already did, but then I had an issue. I don't know if I had an issue, but um, earlier when I was kind of playing with it, trying to record, 
it wasn't saving the recording. Like, I don't know if it's because maybe it's taking forever because, you know, everybody's using Zoom right now. But then when I switched over to my school account, it kind of processed a recording of a video pretty quick and I saved it onto the computer. Yeah. Or but so, I don't know if we have that type of permission. We You do with the school account. So if you have a, a private account, unless you pay for the pro version, there's some things that are limiting, um, mm -hmm. which is why I keep stressing doing conferzoom.org because that's what gives you access to that enterprise um, or the pro version of Zoom. And that's what the chancellor is paying for. I mean, not himself, but you know, the chancellor's office. So you have different recording options. Um, I'll show you what the default settings are. It could be in the default settings um, and it could be just taking a little bit of time to process as well. All righty. So numerous possibilities. We'll walk through what um, ConferZoom does and see if that resolves, um, it answers any of the questions that might have come up. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in so that we can go through some of the features that you'll see if you sign once you be become a, um, a user. All right. So here is, you can see all of the meetings that I've set up. Um, and they've all aggregated right here for me, very handy dandy. Um, what's neat is that anything you set up through Canvas as well, when we look at that in just a second, will also generate into here because it's all pointing back to the same platform or the same landing page. So if I go into settings, Right, let me hop, let me pop into profile real quick. So if you go into your profile and you see that you're a licensed user type, then that means that you've got that the version that you want and you have the capacity 300. So the free version of Zoom, I think the capacity is 15 and it, it's um, your recording time is super short under a half an hour. So the, the, the pro version or the licensed version is very beneficial to have for right now for, for any time, but it's, it's, it's a, re, a great tool that the chancellor's office is paying for. So let's pop into settings. All right. So ConferZoom has a whole bunch of really cool settings. And what we're going through right now is what the default settings would be. So if I set up a meeting in ConferZoom, these are the settings that will by default be enabled or disabled. For every meeting that you set up, you can go in and change these settings as well. But for most of us, there's gonna be certain settings that we would like to have for every meeting and most of the time they'll stay fairly stable. Um, many of these are pretty self-explanatory when you go through and read what it means right here. We always say that um, college faculty and staff make the worst students and we really, really do. So I, I can promise you, you're gonna be tempted to just look at this title and think you know what it means or say, I don't know what it means and not wanna read this whole thing. So just make sure and read all of that. They're not all perfectly explanatory, but for the most part, they really um, indicate what that permission, whether it's toggled on or off, allows you to do. Um, so the first thing is whether you want to start the meeting as a host with the video on or off. I have mine off because I don't always look like this when I do a Zoom video. Sometimes I don't want the video on and I don't even want to see that anybody, my students or whatnot to see me for a second because Saturday morning does not have the same appearance as it does right now. So I started with the off, just better safe than sorry sometimes. Um, and then you can always turn it on. Um, also, you never know where your videos, video is going to be pointing. So even if um, you're pretty sure it's set up, your video could be pointing someplace you don't want it to point. So I always start it with off and then give that option as well. Um, same thing with a participant video. I don't want to take anybody by surprise and all of a sudden the video is on and have images that I'd rather not to be seared into my brain. So this is my default as I have it off. Audio type, when you create a meeting, it's going to create different ways for students to log in um, or, or whoever you're giving this invitation to. The telephone and computer audio, both are great options to enable because as you can tell, you have someone that's called into this meeting and it allows them to hear what's going on even if they don't have internet connections. So at the very least, they're able to engage audibly. Um, it confer Zoom or Zoom has a fabulous app that allows you to connect with your cell phone. I've been on more Zoom calls than I care to relay driving down the road in my car. So it's, it's a great option um, to be able to have. 
join before host. This is highly personal. Um, I like people to be able to get in before me because um, I don't know why sitting in a waiting room irritates me. So that's it's a total personal preference. There is no advantages or there's no right or wrong when it comes to that. Um, having a personal meeting room, um, you can um, use that personal meeting room when scheduling a meeting. Let's see. I don't want to go through each and every one of these, but just to talk about some of them. You can require a password um, for mm -hmm. new meetings. So the thing to think through with password is it does make it where it's a more secure meeting and someone has to have it before coming in. Um, personally, every Zoom meeting I'm in that requires a password, it really irritates me because I have to either write it down somewhere or if I am in a call using my cell phone, then I've got to toggle back between the screens, try and cut and paste it, find a scrap of paper in my car. So unless there really is a reason that you have to have a password, just think through. It's an additional step that the person engaged in the meeting is going to have to take. I always try and toggle on um, mute participation participants upon entry um, because not everybody mutes themselves and so it's nice to have it muted upon entry. I've usually got, gotten into the habit um, of if I'm hosting a larger webinar um, just going through and muting people automatically and then having them mute themselves afterwards. Enabling chat. Um, there is not a whole lot of reasons why you wouldn't allow chat. Um, the number one thing that you're going to experience as a difficulty for participants in a confer Zoom is figuring out their audio. Sometimes the computer doesn't recognize the mic they want to use, and I'll troubleshoot, I'll show you how to troubleshoot that in just a second. But if you enable the chat, worst case scenario is if they don't, if they can't figure out their audio, at least they can still use the chat. Most of the time, the people can still hear you. They just haven't gone through and set up their mic so they can't be heard when they speak. So enabling this chat option um, makes it so that's always going to be a possibility. Private chat. I know some people don't want participants to be able to chat amongst themselves. I really like it because if I have something, uh, if I've got a peer or a friend on there, they can send me a private chat and tell me if something wonky is going on with my screen or in my backdrop or if my face or something. So I like having the private chat enabled, not a right or a wrong thing. Um, play sounds when participants join or leave. If you're doing some sort of office hour or something where it's going to be open for a while, I really like being able to hear a chime when someone enters because then I can have confer zoom on in the background and be doing other things and engage when somebody comes in. So I've used zoom a lot for my office hours with my students or um, for faculty open office hours. So by allowing this chime to be played when somebody comes and goes, then I can put my attention elsewhere and when somebody comes in, then shift my attention. Um, allowing a co-host. So um, if somebody asks me for a Zoom meeting, then a lot of the times if I know they have a confer Zoom account, then I'll enable them as a co-host. Polling is a lot of fun. If you enable that, then you can create a poll before your Zoom meeting and then deploy it, um, especially if you've got a large gathering and you don't want to unmute people then you can deploy a poll and so you don't have 100 people trying to talk over one another or even 25 to 30 it can get a little chaotic so you can deploy a poll and they can answer that way screen sharing so that's what i'm doing right now as a host so if i were to um, turn this off then um, to make it so host only can screen share, you guys would not be allowed to screen share. As it is, on the bottom of your screen, you should have a little green box on your Zoom toolbar that it has your mute, your stop video, and polls, but it also has that button to share. So you can't share over me because I've said only the host can share over somebody, but if I were to stop share, you would be able to share. And I like the combination of this because it allows, if I'm working with a student, it allows them to share their screen and I can walk them through if they're seeing something on their screen to show me. But it allows me to override them if they share their screen and it's something inappropriate or if I'm done with them sharing their screen and they're not stopping. Um, so then I can override their screen sharing setting. Um, annotation is a whole lot of fun. 
So especially if you're working with a student and you're going over some piece of paperwork and you want to be able to annotate it, similar to how you would do a um, writing on a document in front of you. So if I annotate, you should be able to see my pen. Um, so I can say, you know, whatever it might be. I'm not sure why I'm deciding to write in cursive, but um, are you guys able to see annotating on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I can do different stamps. That's the stamp option. I can write in oh. text. Um, I can do a oh, spotlight. Um, and then I, so I can do all sorts of really fun things. I'm just using all of the different features that are there. And you can cause a, a ripe old mess on your screen. There's also a button on that toolbar, and you guys can't see it, but when you pull up your annotate, that says clear. So I can clear all the drawings that are on there, and I can clear the viewer's drawing. And you guys, I can't remember if I've enabled it. You might be able to annotate. If you toggle over your Zoom toolbar, and that's the toolbar that has the mute, the video, the polls, you might have a button that says annotate. And I can't remember if I enable it by default or not for this meeting. So the Zoom toolbar can be one of the frustrating things to try and find. It's always on your screen. It just likes to hide. It's usually on the bottom. If you can't find it, hover over the bottom of your screen. You can always hover over the camera icon and it'll pop up. Okay. So you guys can try if you want to try and annotate on the screen. Where is that annotate again? So it's all, if you have it, and I apologize for the exercise and frustration if it's not there, but if it were to be there, it would be on the same toolbar that has the microphone, the mute button, the stop video, or the video button um, along that toolbar. But I might have disabled it. No, I don't see it. Okay. So I think I, I, used, I, I was pretty sure I had it disabled, but oh no, somebody's there because someone's putting hearts on there. Oh. So somebody sees it. Chat. If you go to view options at the top where it says you're viewing Amanda's screen, if yeah. you do the drop down, it'll give you the annotate. So just click on it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh -huh. oh, very good. Perfect. So that can be a lot of fun. Now, what I can do as the host is I have the option on the annotate toolbar is so you can see that you guys are clearing your own screen, but I can go in and I can clear the viewer's drawing. So I just cleared your drawings and I can keep clearing them and deleting you because you guys are all fun. Look at you. So you guys are annotating. I'm just clearing you and I can also clear my drawings. So you never have to worry about cluttering it all up. There is an undo and a redo too. So it's a fun option to be able to have, especially when you're working with students like you guys might be with documents and talking through different types of documents. It, it might be beneficial to be able to annotate on there. Let's see. So in meeting advanced, you guys are having fun with the annotate still. Mm-hmm. So in meeting advanced, breakout rooms, if you're doing a large session or even, a, um, it doesn't have to be a large session, what a breakout room allows you to do is that I could take as the host and break you up into smaller groups. So there's 10 of us here. If I wanted to say, all right, I want you to go um, work with a partner or work with two people, then I could force people out into however many breakout rooms that I want you. And then as the host, I can force you back into the break, uh, back into the um, joined meeting. So it, I'm not sure what context um, you guys might use that in, but I like to show it as an option to play with and have fun with. Closed captioning is um, um, set to on. You can't actually turn that off, but you can assign um, the host to be able to closed caption or to request a closed captioner. Now, um, it might be more difficult to get a closed captioner in for your Zoom meetings now because we have a lot of people using Zoom in the California Community College um, centers, but this is always a possibility too. And different options walking through. I'm trying to think. Um, so the... 
now I've lost the vir oh, virtual background. So what you need to enable here, you can see that I have a green screen um, behind me. If I want to add a virtual background, then I need to make sure and toggle this on in my settings. And that'll give me the option during a meeting to allow a virtual background. All Do right. you have a green screen behind you? You have to have some sort of um, colored screen or some sort of screen that does not have any of the colors that are on you. So the reason that green screens like this are typically chosen is because not many people wear that color green, um, but I've seen them blue too. So whatever flat color you have, that's not going to be on you. So one funny anecdote that I discovered recently is usually I'm using a green screen in, in a poorly lit office. I was using my green screen in my home office that is much better lighting. And I realized that because I have green eyes, there was many parts of them that were the same color as my green screen, which made the background come out my eyes. So it was incredibly creepy um, to the attendees. I actually had one that asked me to turn it off because it was creeping her out too much. Um, so just, just be aware of that if you have blue eyes or green eyes, that if you are, the lighting seems to matter, um, but that can make your background come out your eyes. Um, because it's, it's, I won't go into the technicality of green screens, but just, just be aware. Um, it'll do the same thing if you're wearing the same color anywhere on you of the green screen. It basically makes that disappear and become invisible to the camera. So the recording option, um, here's where you have the option to either create, get a local recording, and that's going to be an MP4 you can store on your computer or a cloud recording. Now the MP4 is going to take up more computer space. It's going to take a little bit longer to render. So if you have this toggled on, then it's going to take a little bit longer for you to get that notification of an MP4. The cloud recording is going to be a link that people can access via a link. And this is going to be um, a much quicker way because you can also just share the link. And I'll show you in my previous recordings um, where you can share that out. But you'll also get an email if that's what you've enabled. Now, the more of these advanced settings that you've selected, it's going to take a little bit longer to render and you're going to get a whole long list of things that are in your cloud recording. Automatic recording, I always encourage this not to be on. You just have to remember to start the recording. I forget a lot, um, but it also, if it starts out recording and I forget and I'm having a conversation, when I stop recording, it's not going to let me start recording again until that first recording has finished rendering. Mm -hmm. So that can make it difficult if you mess up and you say, man, I just had a private conversation. I don't want that to be on my recording. Stop recording and start again. It'll make it difficult to do that because of the, the time delay on those two things. So that, that is the main reason why I recommend not having it start recording. I also think it's important that participants hear um, that disclaimer, this meeting is being recorded so that they know if they don't want to be recorded, then they don't have to use their voice or they can send a message to the host saying, um, I don't want you to use my name because I don't want to be in the recording. Whatever it might be, um, people have a right to that privacy. Okay. So those are the basic settings. Oops. So I'm going to go over to my meeting so you can see if I have previous meetings that are recorded, then I can always pick up these and go to, um, oh, the recordings aren't enabled yet. So if the recordings are there, oh, these maybe haven't even started yet. Um, Hmm. The recordings will be available to me, but it doesn't look like anybody recorded them. So these are meetings I had set up for somebody else. So you'd have a recording that was available. It doesn't look like anybody recorded it. Now, the host has to come in before it all begins, correct? If you set that as your default. Mm -hmm. So if I put that in my settings as, um, let's see, join before host. So I enable people to join before the host. So that's how you guys were able to get into this meeting before I was here. Otherwise, it, you have a disclaimer that says, wait until the host joins. Okay. So you have that option. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any more questions about the confer Zoom setup? 
No, good. All right, I'm gonna pop in and just show you real quick in a matter of seconds about the Canvas, um, the Canvas integration. So I'm just on my other screen. And that's why it's always beneficial to have muted because when your phone rings, um, Um, so, but though I will show you if you do the screen, so I'm going to stop share right here and I will let you, anybody would like to share. Be careful when you share your screen, what you have on it. So I'll let you practice scare, sharing right now. So you should have a little green button on your toolbar that says share. See if anybody wants to play with sharing. There you go. See, and now we see what's on your computer screen. So hopefully it's nothing we shouldn't be seeing. There is a password, so. Oh, a Y drive. Yep. So that's how we share. So now as a host, I can actually share over you. So I can force you to stop sharing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so then that's the advantage. So if something were to pop up and oh, I don't want to see that, then I can as the host share over you. So that's the advantage of that. So I'm going to stop sharing and let you have it again. I just wanted to demonstrate that as a host, um, I could share over you if someone else wants to practice. Does anybody else want to practice sharing? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off early. I just want to show you the advantage of a host. Option. All right, so now I bet you're using the whiteboard, right? So when you share, you have the option to use the whiteboard and it looks like I didn't see, oh, there you go, perfect. So the two steps when you share is you have to push share and then share screen. So you have to select the screen you wanna share and then put share screen. All right, so hopefully, if did anybody else want to give that a try? Zoom is one of those things where once you become familiar with it um, and even use it a couple of times, it, it takes away that fear. Perfect, so now you got the whiteboard too. Okay. See, not too bad. All right, so I'm going to pop into Canvas. Let me get a, my other screen up. I just want to make sure I get into my sandbox. Here we go. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, so what you see on my navigation menu is confer Zoom right here. If you haven't enabled it, you probably won't be able to see it in your Canvas box. So I'm gonna tell you what to do if you don't see it, which you probably won't. So I just hit the settings option in my Canvas course and then did navigation. So everything up here in this top box is what students have access to or even some things that if I disable it, I um, need to put up here to have access to it. So I'm gonna pretend that confer is zoom is down here. So this long list of other options are menu items that I can put in my navigation bar. So you wanna make sure and if you have a Canvas shell students have access to that it's nice and clean to only using the links that you're going to be using. So I'm gonna move the confer zoom link up to the top. You can also use this um, three dots, I call them a shish kebab. You can always use the shish kebab to move it up. I'm a drag and drop type of girl, so I like to just drag it up there. This is one of the parts that you do have to add save. There you go. All right, so now my confer zoom is back there. So all I did was click on it and it opened up this window. So one of the things to be aware of is that some browsers will block 
confer zoom from opening. So just take a look, um, view your browser up top and see if it's blocking the pop up. Most of the time it's a uh, something with an X through it. Um, it sometimes looks like a camera or, or, or um, different types of icons, but it'll be a, a big red X or something indicating it's blocked some sort of pop-up. It's not very um, pronounced. So if something doesn't look like that's happening, that should be happening, um, then it might be blocked. Yep. So let me, I'm going to go through that again, looking at the chat. I'll walk through it one more time. Oh, I don't know why it's not letting me go back to my course. Here we go. All right. So I'm in my course. And I'm going to go to settings. And then navigation. And more than likely, confer zoom is going to be in this bottom column. So I'm going to take that item and drag it up to the top. And then at the bottom of that second column, choose save. Hmm. You might not be a teacher in the course that you're in. I'm responding to the chat. So let me look send me a message or, or a private message me or send put it on here the um, the section number and I can take a look at it because you should be able to find um, if you're a teacher in the course then you should have settings uh, sure let me stop share there we go okay go ahead So uh, go into the specific course, um, let's see. You have to be, it has to be a course you're a teacher in. So try the Latino Faculty Staff Association. There, so confer Zoom is already there, but I'll show you the process. That, perfect, yep. So if confer Zoom was at the bottom, you'd want to drag it up. Um, and I would recommend cleaning up this navigation menu anyway. Everything is visible. So it might be good to just make it a little bit more clean. Perfect. Yep. You can put it wherever you want and then save it. There you go. So if you hit that confer zoom option, So now this means you need to sync your account. So on that far right hand side, hit that account setting in that itty bitty blue. There you go. Did you just hit it? You were too quick. Yep. Now you are synced. So to slow you down a little bit, on that far right hand side, hover over that account settings. And that's what needs to be clicked in order to sync your account. Yep. And you are good. So I am going to go ahead and share over you. Oh, don't leave the meeting. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go to confer Zoom. And as was indicated by our lovely Vanna, it is account settings is what you're going to click on to sync your account. And it should be pretty quick if you have an account set up and verified. Um, so I have an event happening right now that I set up um, just when I was having fun um, or training somebody else. So I could go into this that I've already scheduled an event or I can go into another uh, schedule and create another event. So if I have something that I need to just launch really quick, then I can do a quick launch and that's gonna start a meeting right away that I can invite someone to. If I wanna schedule a meeting in advance, then I would schedule it right here. But I wanna go through the process that you guys are most likely to use. And I think you're most likely to use the link in, in the, directly within Confer Zoom. So I'm gonna navigate back to Confer Zoom first. And then if you guys want me to talk about hosting it in Canvas, then we can go over there. But I think for the most part, you'll probably be creating 
the meetings directly in ConferZoom. Let's see. So are you seeing my Zoom account in front of you? The screen share, follow me, okay. Yes, are you guys seeing Zoom? I can't see anybody's head anymore. You guys see Zoom okay? Somebody go there. Yes. yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go to meetings. And I'm going to schedule a new meeting. And you can name it, topic, whatever you want. If you're scheduling with these with students, then it might be good to have the student's name in there if you're just going to send it to that student. And that way you know this is the meeting I have with this student. So. Oops, I can spell my name. So the description is going to be in here. If it's something particular you want to go over with a student, you can always put it there. I'm pretty lazy and I just cut and paste it from the topic. You're scheduling a meeting, so it's whenever you'd like to have that meeting in the future. So I'm going to have it tomorrow at five o'clock. The duration, you're not going to get kicked out of the meeting if you exceed your duration. You're just letting the person know who you're inviting, what they can expect the duration to be. Time zone defaults to Pacific, which is handy, you have the option to create a reoccurring meeting. So if you wanted to create a meeting that happened every week on Wednesday, um, and it's going to default to this 5 p.m. start, or when you want it to end by, or how many occurrences, then you have that option. I'm going to do just a, um, not do a reoccurring meeting for now and keep it simple. I can use my personal meeting ID or I can create another meeting ID. Um, if it's somebody that it's a, another faculty or a staff that I'm meeting with and you can do a personal meeting ID for students, it might be beneficial to generate a unique meeting ID. That way you don't have to worry about other students using the meeting ID. Uh, there are benefits. You still have to approve before somebody comes into an existing meeting if you have that as your setup. So something for your department to think through and what would be more advantageous to share. Uh, if you're doing a personal meeting ID, then you know, requiring a meeting uh, password might be something to talk about. Same options. So we had those, um, what you set as your default is going to carry over right here and you can change it, those basic meeting um, settings that we went through. You can change what you have defaulted. If you have an alternative host and they're a confer Zoom user, you can enter them in here and they will have the same hosting privileges that you had. So once I've filled all of this in, then I'm going to hit save. Um, I personally don't like how these integrations work. So I just go to either copying this confer zoom link if I know it's somebody that's going to be only joining me via the um, confer zoom computer platform. But if I want to give them the entire information that I'm going to want to copy the invitation and you have all of the telephone numbers that they can call, as well as the link, the topic of the meeting, and the time. So you can copy the meeting, copy the meeting invitation, and then go ahead and put it into a Word document. So I'm going to open up, or not a Word document, sorry. You can put it into an email. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to pop it into a Word document so you can see what it looks like. But you can simply cut and paste that entire invitation into an email, into a Canvas announcement, whatever venue you're using to communicate the Zoom meeting, then you can just plop that entire invitation in there. Now, um, for example, since we're all gonna be meeting, it would be okay to put it in their Outlook where it goes, because when we accepted mm -hmm. the meeting, uh, when you sent it to us, was it a schedule a meeting through Outlook and then you post it in there? Um, yeah, so I have the Outlook integration, mm -hmm. and when you log in, it'll give you that option. So if you can see my screen, I can schedule a meeting with Zoom. So I've got the Zoom integration, and I can schedule it right here. 
but I didn't do it that way this time because sometimes this, it, the process irritates me a lot of times. So all that I did was created an Outlook meeting and just cut and pasted that right in there. Okay. Whoops. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the Zoom integration can be good in the Outlook, but I've, they have three different steps and I just, it bugs me. So I simply just copy the invitation, create a meeting in Outlook and plop it right in there. And those are really all the basics that you need to know. Well, we're going to try this tomorrow. Great. And then if I have any issues, you definitely will hear from me. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I, I can guarantee that the muting and unmuting and audio is going to be the first thing you'll experience. Okay. So that's just, it, it is. And, and getting people to set up their microphones so people will be talking and not have their microphones set up. Um, so unfortunately you can't see my toolbar, but if you open yours up, you'll probably be able to see it next to the microphone, that little carrot you have audio options. And if somebody can't get their mic to work, I always tell them, go and try the test speaker and computer. I did that, that was good. Yeah, perfect. And that's usually, most of the time, will eradicate the issue because it goes through the process of finding the right speaker. And same thing if you're working with students, um, just being patient and walking them through that. And again, the, the worst case scenario is you have to use chat and at least they're still seeing you and they can hear you and they can respond via the chat message. Very good. Yep. So that is it. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. We'll be in touch and uh, hopefully it'll work out for all of us. Yep. And I will send you the recording, so I'm going to stop the recording.